Hi, I'm Perry Carpenter, one of the hosts of the Digital Folklore Podcast, and welcome to our second installment of Digital Folklore Unplugged. These unplugged episodes are all about stripping away the fancy production elements so that we can give you access to raw or only slightly edited interviews with our folklore experts. Today's guest is Dr. Diane Rogers. Hi, I'm Diane Rogers. Dr. Rogers is a senior lecturer in media at Sheffield Hallam University, where she specializes in alternative media and storytelling in television and film. Her research interests relate to the communication of folklore and contemporary legend in the media, including folk horror, folklore on screen, the supernatural, spooky television programming aimed at children, and other darkly fascinating topics. Diane's PhD research was on folk horror and hauntology in Weird, W-Y-R-D, 1970s British film and television. She's also a co-founder of the Center for Contemporary Legend Research Group, which you'll hear us discuss near the end of the interview. Oh, and if you're one of our wonderful Patreon supporters, you'll get access to these interviews a few days early before we release them on any other platform. Okay, let's get unplugged. Hi, I'm Diane Rogers. I am a senior lecturer at Sheffield Hallam University in the UK, and I'm one of the co-founders of the Centre for Contemporary Legend, which is a research group interested in folklore and contemporary legend. My own particular area of interest is folklore as communicated in the media, particularly film and television. I would love to get just a, a brief sketch about your path into folklore. What made you decide to focus a you know major chunk of your time and attention on the study of folklore? Well, I think it, it stems from an interest just in horror in general. I've been fascinated with horror since I was a little girl, and my granddad used to let me stay up too late to watch lots of weird 70s and 80s TV, Tales of the Unexpected, um, Something I was talking about recently was that I saw half of American Werewolf in London when I was mm. way too young and it terrified me. And I'd thought it was, I'd got it muddled up with Teen Wolf, which is a very different film. <laughs> <laughs> and halfway through, my grandparents saw that my face was white and said, Would you like us to turn it off? I said, Yes, please turn it off. Um, but I've, it kind of my my I remember my it resulted in a conversation with my dad who said explained to me that well it's a film it's not real and there are people making it and there's a director and camera and then I was became obsessed with film and horror film particularly and was a fan of all those kind of classic eighties slasher movies Nightmare on Elm Street and all that kind of stuff. Um, but in in terms of getting more into the folklore stuff, it was only in the last five ten years. Um, I was started to think about a lot of the very strange TV shows that I watched, particularly in Britain. There were seemed to be a lot of programs in the 70s and 80s that featured witchcraft or stone circles or UFOs and all that kind of stuff. Really presented it in quite a sinister, very plausible kind of a way. And I was talking to colleagues and people of a similar age, or maybe a little bit older than me, and we all somebody said, no wonder we grew up weird. And I thought, <laughs> oh yeah, there's all this stuff going on. And so I thought there were people talk just about starting to talk about folk horror in, in academia at least, but nobody was really talking about folklore in folk horror. They were trying mm. to outline, well, what is folk horror? Is it use of the landscape and this and that? And how does it look? But nobody was really making the folklore of it predominant. And that's what I was interested in and why that was so predominant in, in those eras. That's awesome. That's an interesting dividing line to explore because I think it's counterintuitive to those or harder to understand for those of us that are on the outside of the academic study of folklore. Like when you talk about um, folk horror and then the folkloric analysis of horror or expression of horror, wh what are the differences between those two things? How, how can you help us understand what that is? Do you mean in terms of how people talk about them? Any and all. I mean, you talked about the fact that there was one way that uh, 
horror was being explored before you entered it and and you were really wanting to kind of take an you know different angle on that study yeah i guess when when i started to look at this stuff nobody was really writing about folk horror at all to be honest um uh other than maybe a few fan sites and blogs and people were starting to talk about folk horror um which has been being increasingly used as a ter- like a generic term like it's a genre as if you mm. know slasher or a folk horror or you know as if, as if it's a, a definite type of horror um and there was a lot of where people did start to write about it in academia was well, what is folk horror? What do we mean in this genre or this subgenre? Um, and people in, in those discussions were looking at, um, well, what are the narrative tropes of folk horror? How, how, are, how are folk horror stories structured? Where are they set? It's usually in an isolated community or in a rural landscape and those kinds of things. So people were kind of connecting the content of folk horror and not many people were looking at the the actual well when i say actual folklore that's kind of a contentious term in itself but for example i mean the writing of um the uh, that i really admire is a writer called michael coven um and he's written about film and folklore and he'd written a a chapter about the wicker man and about mm. how um cuz one of the things that interested me was how films like the wicker man it's become so ubiquitous with folklore and people tend to think, oh, well, it's presented in such a plausible way that people must have burned wicker effigies and done these kind of rituals because of the way, and things like Midsummer as well, um, which is a more modern equivalent, people seem to take it for granted that these things really happened or existed in some way. Um, And, and, nobody had really written about, well, did these things really happen? What is the real folklore behind it? Um, So I was starting to read the few bits and pieces that people had written about, um, well, were there giant effigies burnt? And and it didn't really happen. It's made up and it's based on a very famous book called The Golden Bough that was originally um, published in 1890, I think, by uh, Sir James Fraser. And there are lots of folkloric beliefs that are permeated in the media that are based on this one book. But that in itself is discredited amongst folklorists. So it talks about all these rituals and things that used to happen in ancient fire rituals in Europe and this, that, and the other. Um, But his book on folklore is quite widely discredited these days. he's, He's kind of picked and mixed lots of bits and pieces and put them together. And People, particularly in the in the seventies, thought, "Well, this is real." So then they based media texts on it, right? And then it kind of pervades into popular consciousness, and people think, "Oh, these things really happened." So that that's a very long uh, way of explaining, you know, how ideas come about in culture and how folklore is passed down and what people think is folklore, mm. um, and that is the kind of stuff that I wanted to look at in terms of British television, because there are lots of things about the purposes of of stone circles or witchcraft rituals or that kind of stuff. And I wanted to see, well, do these things really exist in, in recorded folklore and history and how are they being communicated through film and TV? It's a very funny journey for that book because it would sort of, it started as just this person mixing, mashing, making stuff up. And then in a way, because a lot of people believed it and started spreading those stories, uh, that's kind of a form of ostension in a way. And then it becomes folkloric uh, as we share and represent them in different ways. So that's kind of funny that that was the origin of that. I've never heard of this book. The Golden Bough. Maybe it's, I don't know if it's particularly a British uh, thing, but it's, well, I was going to say, well, it's not that super well-known, but in those kind of circles, it's well-known. It's even directly referenced in... um, there was a television play in 1970 called Robin Redbreast. That was a BBC TV play. And it's kind of similar to The Wicker Man, but much more understated. And I think it's much creepier. Um, and it's a, it's a feature length television play. And in that, 
uh, one of the characters directly quotes James Fraser's Golden Bough. He and it's talks about um, it. It the the main idea taken from it is the sacrificial ritual of a young king whose blood will spill and the crops will be rejuvenated from it. And that's the main idea that he kind of helped perpetuate and is used in lots and lots of things. But Robin Redbreast predates The Wicker Man by a, a couple of years. Uh-huh. So that's worth watching if if you like this creepy kind of stuff and like obscure BBC TV plays. <laughs> So this this gets into another conversation that we had with another guest, which was about kind of footnote pasta um, being taken from these things that are incredibly wrong. Um, it may have been created by somebody that was sincere or may have been fabricated just to kind of fill an information vacuum. And then everybody jumps on that. And because all of these footnote trails, n- nobody's really doing the real work to validate the initial source for everything. It becomes this common belief that everybody buys into, and it gets super hard to discredit because it's sewn into the consciousness of society at that point. Yeah, and and like Mason mentioned, ostention, and one of the things I write about is mass mediated ostention. Mm. So the idea that these beliefs and ideas are communicated in media texts, and the fact that they're presented in a plausible or believable way, and given a kind of false sense of history. I was going to do air quotes, but obviously you're not recording the video. So (laughs) a a false sense of, uh, a fake sense of history, kind of a fake folklore or fake law has been referred to as well. Yeah. Um, As long as it raises the, in the mind of the audience, the possibility for belief, it's had some kind of ostensive effect. It's been, you know, it's made you think, oh, maybe there are ghosts or maybe that was Mm. a ghost or maybe even though I don't personally believe in it, maybe that's some kind of possibility or explanation for it. Um, Yeah. Sorry. I completely wandered off tangent there. No, I love that. (laughs) No, that, that was great. I want to, and this is not something I plan to talk about, but since you kind of mentioned, um, you know, whether somebody really believes in it or not, there's always the the question of, you know, as a folklorist is studying a certain um, folk group or, or folk belief, um, there is almost a prime directive in that, that uh, the folklorist is not supposed to impose their understanding of right or wrong or belief or unbelief uh, on this people group. Um, how do you approach that as somebody that's studying things like um, ghosts and uh, and things that go bump in the night with people that have strongly held beliefs on one side or the other about the paranormal and the you know things like the afterlife and such? Well, I, th- I think like what you said, um, the kind of prime directive is if you believe it, I believe it's real for you. I mm. I do not look down on your experience or, you know, that there's a history when the study of folklore first came about, there was this kind of antiquarian perspective of a tradition of disbelief, uh, looking a, a little bit, looking down at, you know, the rural folk and that they were separate somehow, but we're all folk. We all have yeah. folklore, whether it's something paranormal or supernatural or whether you believe that the toilet roll should go a certain way around on the toilet roll holder. That's still folklore. You know, there's a reason, you know, so we all have that. And I, I don't um, discriminate between beliefs or non-beliefs, but I, I, what I find interesting in studying this is, well, how did you come to that belief or why do you believe that? It's the how and the why of it, not the literal what you believe. Uh, one, one of the things I've, I was thinking about the other day, actually, that I'd not thought about before was uh, uh, as part of my PhD research, I interviewed quite a few writers and directors of film and TV um, who were prominent in the kind of folk horror field. And I was thinking about a lot of them were quite particular in telling me that they did not believe in ghosts or mm. whatever the thing was. But th- they also really want to plausibly convince the audience that this could be a, a possible thing. And I, f- I kind of find the paradox of that quite interesting that they're kind of saying, well, I don't believe in ghosts, but I, but I think the best way to make you believe in ghosts is 
to present it in such a way. So I think that, you know, that, that um, core of belief is at the heart of legend and, and folklore. And I, I just find all that really fascinating. It is also interesting that they would go out of their way to make a point to say, I, I don't believe in ghosts. Yeah. And, and one of them, there was a, a, a director called Moira Armstrong, and she was in, well into her 80s when I interviewed her. And she was one of the very few female directors at the BBC who directed lots of plays of the week and that kind of thing. Um, and she directed um, a play called Fairies. And she also directed a version of Charles Dickens' Christmas Carol, which obviously quite heavily features ghosts. Um, and she, and she again was very, I don't believe in ghosts, but then she went on to tell me some ghost stories. Uh, she told me about a supernatural experience that she personally had had and also recounted, uh, ghost stories that someone she knew had had as well. So, uh, there's a lot of uh, complicated stuff all bound up in that that I think is really interesting. Do you push into that cognitive dissonance and ask them, you know, directly? It's like we, you say you don't believe in ghosts, but you have this experience. How do you reconcile that within your own mind? That is something I've only just start, literally started thinking about in the last yeah. week or so. And if I got to do another round of interviews or got to go back to them, um, that is some, because I wasn't particularly researching that directly. I was kind of very much focusing on the TV programs and, and the content of those programs and their, how, how they thought was best to present a ghost or a cult ritual member or whatever it may be. But, um, so my, my research wasn't about their belief. It was about how they chosen to present something but yeah. i think if if i got to if i get to do more research on that i would i would love to push on that a little more i think that would be really interesting so there's just sort of a latent pattern that you saw emerge after like well you know looking at this i've noticed they all said this this similar things i assume it would be something like i don't believe in ghosts per se but i do believe in things that aren't easily explainable <laughs> and then it'd yeah. be interesting to kind of push in to say you know well, what might the phenomena be that that would make you perceive that this is paranormal and and kind of get to where it's a difference without substance behind it or if there's a difference with you know real substance so I, I did actually I did get into that a little bit with um, Jeremy Dyson who hmm. I don't know if you're familiar with his work he he wrote and co-directed the League of Gentlemen TV oh, yeah. series. And he also directed a feature film called Ghost Stories that came out, I think, 2018. Um, and he's very, very well educated on this kind of stuff. And he kind of went off on a tangent about Jungian psychoanalysis and because he, he has an explanation for the hauntings in his film Ghost Stories, which I won't spoil, um, but he comes at it from a very scientific point of view and he did discuss well, I think there are certain psychological things going on and explanations mm. that we can explore. So, yeah, that's that's fun. I know I know there's another area we need to get into, but I also just I just love that uh, someone is making a, a horror film about something paranormal and thinking in their head like, how is this debunkable <laughs> or whatever? It's just kind of a funny and interesting. <laughs> yeah, how thing. can I explain this in a way that is meaningful to my belief system or lack of belief system? I right. Yeah. Well, and you you do hear a number of explanations come up kind of over and over in patterns from people who don't want to believe in like ghosts as being something on the afterlife, but they come across as some kind of, you know, quantum physical impression based on a traumatic thing or uh, a lot of, you know, stored up negative energy and, and things like that. So th that would be really interesting to kind of come to what are the what are the buckets of folk belief about why this certain manifestation happens uh, in some way um but i do want to adding that to the uh, episode ideas list <laughs> yeah there's, there's all stone type theory and stuff like that as well which are kind of covered a little bit so yeah that, that was actually what, out there. what came to mind stone stone memory stone tape that whole because i read a little bit about that a little like a very little bit yeah, we should definitely look at in that at some point. Um, so I want to um, get to some of the thematic questions that we have around one of the other episodes that we're wanting to put together. And the, the theme of this is analog horror. And by that, what we're trying to refer to is 
there there are certain horror movies, certain tropes that when you look at it, one of the um, indicative pieces is old technology that just the sake of it being there, VHS tapes or CRT monitors or um, whatever, whatever other artifacts just kind of bring out the creepiness in some way. And I was wondering if um, somebody with the you know background that you have, if you've got insight into what actually makes those things, what makes us feel that creep factor whenever we look at these older artifacts of technology? Well, just kind of thinking out loud about it, because I love that stuff. I love the physical media of it. And I think that is a big part of it is that it is physical media. It's physically present. It can affect, we have an actual bodily interaction with it. Um, I'm thinking about David Cronenberg's uh, Videodrome and stuff like that, where it's not, well, it is kind of, a, it is a horror film really, isn't it? But yeah. um, where things can come out of the video or go, you know, there's a lot of yeah, things going in and out of each right. <laughs> in that film in unpleasant ways. Um, but that, I mean, that's a, a thematically common to David Cronenberg anyway. But yeah, I think the fact that old, older media, physical media, we can have a physical connection to it, but it also deteriorates. It can also deteriorate in the same way that our bodies can deteriorate. Video mm. wears out or, you know has scratches on it and can has the possibility of kind of a, a level of transience it can be there but it's only fuzzy or you can only quite partially make out what is there um a lot of some of the research that I've done is very directly related to the pit, the pre-digital age so before the internet and digital media came about um, and thinking about why media from that time period is so creepy and haunting to people or why it's been so impactful. And one of the things that, that uh, I've talked about is the idea of fuzzy memory, because you maybe saw something or heard some a radio play or saw a TV show or a film that you couldn't then instantly watch again. There's there's no ability to immediately rewind and rewatch and catch up. So you're stuck with the initial impressions, however strong or blurry, and they might change over time. And it's kind of your your fuzzy memory of it. And it maybe it gets scarier because you can only remember bits and pieces of it. You can't fill in the gaps and you just remember some horrifying image or, or a feeling or something that made you feel in a certain way. And, and that only comes with not, not just physical media, but older media, because it was a time period in which you couldn't see it again. It was broadcast and then it was gone or, you know, the video cost a hundred pounds or because videos were really expensive or it was only on at the cinema and then you couldn't see it again for three years till it was on TV. So yeah, I think that is, there are lots of different elements there going on. More of our interview with Dr. Diane Rogers after this. Welcome back. I wonder if anything, uh, like to relating to the, the fact that it's physical media, I wonder if the reason that what seems like a lot of analog horror, uh, at least what is popular currently, has a very late 80s, early 90s aesthetic. And I wonder if that's just because that was sort of the last of the era of physical media in a lot of ways. Um, because something yeah, that yeah. I, I think is interesting is that it's popular even among people who at this point didn't really have a childhood where that was prominent. Like it makes sense specifically like for, for me when I remember from early childhood was watching VHS tapes and you know, all of that sort of thing. So there's a big part that feels like it might just be nostalgia, but it doesn't seem to be because it's still weirdly popular even amongst people who are younger. Yeah, I talk to my students about this because I teach alternative media, uh, a module. Um, and a, as part of that, I talk to them about music and film and all sorts of different formats. And there's, a, I don't know if it's the same in the US, but there's been a, a revival of vinyl. Uh, uh, rec buying records yeah. has come around again and cassette tapes. Cassette tapes were never that good to start with. No. I mean, I, I <laughs> like the plastic chunkiness of them. Um but it's interesting, like you say, I think it's interesting. There is a kind of nostalgia for 
This is like what I would call hauntological. There's a there's a, a strand of of study called hauntology, that's almost um, a nostalgia for lost futures is the best way to to describe it. So uh, almost uh, we were promised all this stuff that was going to happen, and it re- never really came about. So that there is a lot of media being made that is being described as hauntological. There's a um, Ghost Box Records is a, a record label that makes new music by young people that sounds like it could have come from the 70s or 80s. Uh-huh. It's almost like we were promised all these, I don't know, flying cars and, you know, utopian futures, but it never really came about. So there's, I think there is some, like you say, uh, the idea of nostalgia for something that never really existed or something that never really paid off. And I think physical media is a connection to that or, or trying to recapture something. I am fascinated by hauntology. I've never heard of that. I've not heard that term either. That is so cool. It's a whole thing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's a, yeah, I've written a, a, a fair bit about that. It, it's, it's really interesting. Mark Fisher wrote a book called, Oh, what was it called? Ghosts of my life. Mm. Um, and he, he, that's a really interesting book. And he, he kind of was one of the proponents. He's one of the most interesting writers on hauntology. Um, sadly he's not around anymore, but people t- who write about hauntology and talk about it, um, often reference his work as he described. And he talks about the concepts of what is weird and eerie and a lot of unsettling things in not just media, but generally kind of ties into notions of the uncanny, um, things being present where they shouldn't be, or things being absent where you'd expect to find something. And it's like that the hauntological notion of it is being haunted by a presence of something, by a presence of a past that never really came to fruition. It's quite complicated. I'm struggling to explain it in a a succinct way. Um, It sounds super relevant though, because there's there's a lot there. As we were kind of brainstorming about our theories on why some of this seems to to have so much um, traction and why people do feel this weird spooky effect with looking at old things. There is kind of an uncanniness. There is a degradation of memory as as we look with our rose colored glasses and then we actually look at the technology that was there that was supposed to, you know, save us and be our bright future and, you know, the future is in technicolor. And then you look at it and it's old, you know, nasty, grainy. You can see the pixels and everything when you look at it. Um, the, The colors that we thought were so bright and everything are now faded and kind of look off and yellow. And even when they're presented in their original color scheme, they don't look like the way that we represent color today. Um, So we remember these things very fondly. And then you look back on it and you're like, that doesn't live up to my expectation. And you go, it's really terrifying. (laughs) Yeah. And so then you're trying to reconcile with all of that in some way and it, it becomes a little bit creepy. Yeah. This seems to speak to that persistence of it too, as to why why it has a sticking power. Um, because mm. even for people who didn't grow up in that time, it's still a, a notable part because it was the last of the physical media era, and also like it's still recent enough that people are caring about it. I guess it's like it's in the popular memory. There's something in the in the general consciousness um, that. I, I like to use the word weird with a Y because uh, mm-hmm. I think there's a there's a crossover because people talk about folk horror and hauntology have uh, as separate things, but I think they've actually got a lot in common because I think not everything that I might think of as folk horror is necessarily horrific. It might just be a bit unsettling or unnerving, and it's and you're not quite sure why. And I think it's usually because it's got some kind of hauntological aspect to it. It's unsettling and it's it's haunted by the spectre of memory of a different time or a different era or notions of ancient paganism or ancient religion, you know, which isn't really ancient paganism, isn't really ancient. It's 
the way we think of it, it was invented in the 1930s, for example. Right. So there's loads, there's loads and loads of things tied up. But I like I like to use the word weird because I think it has a crossover between um, uh, what is folk horror, what is hauntological, um, and dystopian narratives as well. So I think all of those kind of cross over in this. Oh, I'm not sure why this is creeping me out, but it is creeping me out. Uh, and I'd say, well, that that's weird TV or weird film. <laughs> I'm stealing. <that. laughs> One of the people that we're talking to is we're trying to rationalize some of our thoughts about this had a theory that, you know, as you look at the analog to digital changeover, there were also a lot of um, interesting things that happened with journalism in general and that the perception of journalism as being this very unbiased type of thing is we're just going to present the facts. Some of the the new laws kind of got it to where opinion could be injected in journalism a lot more. And we um, we end up in the space where we are now, where there's a lot of fracturing in the way that people view that that discipline um, seems to have happened about the same time that we have digital to, to analog changeover. We, have, we get 24 hour TV. There's an information vacuum. Um, do, do you see any of that where maybe um, earlier there was a wide eyed optimism and now as people are looking at it, they're like, oh, the world isn't the way that we thought it was going to be. Or how do you how do you view? I guess if I'm going to get just ask it in a more answerable way. Do you see trends and periods and cutoffs and, and things where there were maybe societal inflection points that create these? Well, it's interesting because I was literally just teaching a class on citizen journalism today mm. and a kind of history of, alter, well, it, as part of alternative media, talking about how the internet has changed activism and journalism to a, to an extent. Um, and it, I, I think it's part of the promise of that utopia is the internet, it's for sharing knowledge, it's for everybody, it's all going to be free and lovely. And it's not free <laughs> in most part, it's full of advertising. And there are lots of voices shouting very loudly on there. And is there, has it created this freely democratic public sphere where everyone can equally have a say? Or is it actually dominated by big businesses and corporations that we were supposed to be, you know, being mm -hmm. liberated from. So I think that has been a really interesting shift. Um, but particularly in the reporting of news, I think that has changed really significantly over the last few decades. Um, one of, again, one of the things that I think that in the 1970s is so linked with folk horror and hauntological kind of stuff is because the repertage of news was was much more authoritative had gravitas you hmm. people looked up to news readers they had to wear a shirt and a tie and they were very somber and it wasn't on a rolling 24 hour news channel it wasn't people shouting at each other opinionated stuff a particular um, particularly in britain with the bbc had a very very strong reputation but even um they would. Th there's an example of a news story in 1977. They reported a news story about the Enfield poltergeist. I don't know if you're familiar with that, and it was covering uh, the Conjuring Two. The movie mm -hmm. is based on the story of the Enfield poltergeist. There was a basically a council house um, in North London somewhere was supposedly haunted by a poltergeist. Uh, and it was presented as a very sincere news story on tea time television for the nation to watch. Uh, there were children uh, kind of uh, channeling demons being mm. possessed on 70s TV. Um, but because people looked up to news readers, it was presented in a very sincere, there, there was no kind of postmodern, eyebrow raising or wink to the audience it was very this is a news this is the news today mm. wow <laughs> um but you you wouldn't get that now <laughs> i mean i don't think you would get those stories covered now but even if you did it would be here's a fun tale you know at the end at the end of a doom laden hour of war and politics <laughs> right. and all the awful things it'd be here's the funny story at the end of the week or here's a funny cat we found on the internet or <laughs> what so I but I think it's it's part of the 
the rolling news has changed it because the news has to find lots of content to it's become entertainment in a sense it's got to keep people interested um but that whole idea of everybody having access to it and the digital age shifting what it's about is it's made it more equal and democratic in a sense that everybody can bring their news their grassroots news and tell their their truth uh which is great but also there are still some louder voices than others and I'm not sure if I answered your question but that's just all the stuff I've been thinking about today (laughs) and there's I mean there's so much to in just like being a person who's been very online my entire life like the uh the early internet was such an optimistic place just very much full of people making their own things and like we're we've all slowly watched it uh, platformize into these major pillars that now are just what there's, you know, there's four sites that you go to basically. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and that's changed the way that people can share things and how things spread. And yeah. Cause it did used to feel like there were lots of separate chat rooms and forums and you could, there was a, a cause I'm part of the, the uh, music scene in my town and I've been involved in bands and record labels and stuff here. And we had our own little Sheffield music hub. And then that, as soon as something like Facebook comes along, suddenly it's much broader and it's much less grassroots and yeah, it's interesting. Yeah. And it went from like, Oh, I need to update my website code. So I need to schedule a week's worth of posts and pay for them to show up in people's feeds. As you were talking though, I was thinking about we've, we've moved almost from a, a pop culture way of doing things where you've got like a, a one to many communication to something that does support a lot more, uh, a lot more folk groups. You know, many, very many to many communication is possible on the internet. But when you when you think about this from a horror trope perspective, and you're looking at old technology, one of the things that people typically find is like an an old reel that has a you know a singular announcer that's supposed to be this trusted authority or shadowy figure um, that is then presenting the you know quote unquote truth for that that segment. Um, and it's usually really grainy. And I'm wondering if there's something about the um, the medium that that gets presented on or the fact that back then, you know, there was a time when it was a person in a suit and tie presenting the quote unquote truth um, that carries a, an interesting psychological weight if there's some baggage that we're trying to address with ourselves there. I think it's both of those things. But I think what you're saying about the I think the medium itself is significant because it exists physically. There's a piece of celluloid that, uh, that, that's that got this story on it. It's not just something ephemeral that is there and gone and lost in a Twitter thread or something like that. If it's something, I think things seem more real if you can hold it in your hands and, and not even, yeah. and that, and thereby kind of more plausible. You can buy into it more because it physically exists. Even if you've not got it in your own personal hands, the fact that, you know, it exists in some real way that maybe that adds to the believability or the plausibility of it as well as the era from which it came. Just a quick aside that what you made me think of is I'm sure you've seen the trend where people will like print out a meme and then staple it to a telephone pole and take a picture and share it because, and it seems so much more like it might be a real thing just because it is in the physical world. That tie seems like a really important one. And as as you were talking through that, one of the things I was thinking is like, if you pop in a VHS cassette and then now you watch this person, it feels a little bit like you're resurrecting something. There's a little ritual with it. There's steps that you put in and it's taking something that is ephemeral and then bringing it into the real world there's a little bit of uh, ostensive property with that too yeah like you're f- literally bringing something to life or raising conjuring a- yeah exactly conjuring something get it's like um getting an old family photo album out mm. of a box or blowing the dust off it or there's something leafing through those pages feels very different and much more ritualistic like you say than flicking through some photos on your phone or that's it's again it's that feels in in opposition it's it feels so ephemeral and they're there and gone but if it's in a physical form and you can handle it and or push the tape in the machine and listen to it because it's not just about the physicality of it it's all of the senses isn't it because it makes the sound it makes the smell it has all of that stuff is a sensory memory that you're building so 
that's that's interesting actually because that's a lot to do with how memory works isn't it about if you have a a sound or a smell you're much more likely to remember something vividly than just one sense so our interaction with the media uh, physical medium as well is a big part of it mm mm-hmm. The feel of those weird loose white spools. If you're like at the tape, at like yeah, there's just a You've lot. You've got to tighten it up with a pair of scissors or something, or open it. And <laughs> exactly. There's um a, a question that occurred to me that I I don't know that anybody could reasonably answer, but I do want to just throw it out to to both of you. Um, do you think there is a point at which we will move past that conception that 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 like I almost said obsession, but the the pervasiveness of this analog format like will do you think there'll be a point in the future where we're no longer nostalgic for that or is the physical presence such a core piece of human existence that it will potentially stick with us forever well do you think there would be a world without books do you think i mean that's a painful question (laughs) (laughs) i think that's a really good example though i mean as all the other mediums aside we don't need books anymore a lot of my students get all of their research online. I get a lot of my research online. It's e- it's easier in a sense, but I can't imagine going to bed at night and not having a physical book. I mm-hmm. know many people do, but I mean, I'm not that old. I'm in my mid forties, uh, so I'm not super young, but uh, you know, I still like it's it's the ritual thing. Yeah. I never thought cassette tapes would come back. I have students who started buying, you know, people in their teens, early twenties who are buying vinyl cassettes. Um, I don't know if VHS tapes are making a comeback, but I know friends who had got rid of their VHS, their VCRs, and how are kind of resurrecting those in some way. I think. I had a student who was buying CDs again because he saw those as nostalgic. Yeah, really? Yeah, I know. <laughs> After the break, the conclusion of our interview with Dr. Diane Rogers. Welcome back. Uh, but but then but then I think back to like where I don't. There are some things that were nostalgic for I guess from like the 1930s or the 20s usually that fashion tends to be like a cyclical thing in that sense but i don't feel like and maybe maybe i'm just not aware of it i don't feel like there's something that has quite the same pull from then at least not not the creepiness you don't look at a flapper dress and think oh that's creepy yeah maybe wax cylinders or you know with (laughs) yeah (laughs) you do look maybe at some of the dolls from that era and those might be a little bit creepy because there's the uncanny valley nature of how they created a lot of those but not necessarily the technology piece of it it's it's a different manifestation that came out that i think we associate I, with that i wonder if we get, if we get to a, like a brain computer interface level if we'll get nostalgic for mouse clicks and using a keyboard or something like I don't know. Yeah, well, we're, we're merging with technology, aren't we? with Google Glasses and smartwatches and all of that stuff. So the, I think, yeah, maybe well, the, these physical keyboards and things. And ma- it would be funny if they're nostalgic for mice. Uh, I don't know if anyone yeah, misses right. mouse mats. We don't really need mouse mats anymore. But that was a big thing for a while. Right. <laughs> oh, yeah. The amount of promotional mouse pads that were in my house growing up, that was such a thing. There is this... Um... In technology, there's this uh, term called skeuomorphism, which is like where you take the representation of one thing and make it the representation of another, which is why we have a trash can on our you know, desktop to represent, oh, okay. you know, it's, it's the physical thing. Like the that save we're, item is an yeah. icon, is a floppy disk from floppy. the yeah. 80s. <laughs> and, um, you know, there are people that have never played a record in their life, but they know what the sound of a record scratch means in the narrative context. Um, and so we, I think that there are going to be ripples that we sense in the future um, with almost everything, regardless of the interfaces that we change to. It's going to be like why train tracks are, you know, the, the, with a part that they are. It's just, it's always been that way. Um, there's one other thing I want to get your opinion on, because I know you've written on it. And uh, we do have another episode that we're going to explore this too, which is uh, Christmas horror. <laughs> Um, I've seen you write about that. I've seen you uh, yeah. kind of have some, some work there. So what are your thoughts on that as a thing that typically brings its own form of 
ghost story or horror manifestation as it makes it into popular media? What what makes Christmas ripe for those kind of things? And what uh, what do you see as interesting about that? Um, part of it, I think, is the it's cold and it's dark and the family tends to be together and it's almost like a campfire ritual thing, ah. but maybe around a heart, you know, sitting around the, the fire telling stories. Um, there's something kind of, I want to say comforting. I know not everybody finds horror comforting, but I think there's a comforting element of the ritual of it. Again, coming back to the ritualistic nature, there's a pattern to it and there's a, delight and a thrill in those kind of ghost stories. Um, so that's definitely a thing. I mean, obviously it kind of got popularized in the Victorian era uh, to a certain extent, especially with, again, like Charles Dickens writing uh, stories like The Signalman and um, uh, the famous one that my mind's uh, just going Christmas blank. Carol. Christmas Carol, with, yeah, the Christmas, a Christmas Carol. I couldn't remember it either. With, I mentioned it earlier, yeah, and my you mind did. just got uh, got blank. Um, but yeah, I think that there's a there's a certain um, there's a tradition in Britain. There was a series called Ghost Stories for Christmas that there was one made um, not every single year, but many years, certainly throughout the seventies. Uh, many of them were based on Mr. James ghost stories who's kind of been described as the master of the English ghost story even though a lot of his folklore is actually drawn from Scandinavian folklore mm. quite interestingly he has a lot of malevolent spirits in there um, and that is um, a series that has been resurrected in the UK Chris ghost stories for Christmas and there's there's been a few made over the last few years again turning to Mr. James um I want to describe it as a kind of delicious thrill of horror yeah. um, contained in a certain way. And it's, you, you know, cause Christmas, I guess is a time. I mean, every, everybody celebrates different holidays and there's different religions and all that stuff, but it gem, in a very general sense, many people have some kind of break from their work and get together with their family. And it's about a kind of, sharing something to get a shared experience and an entertainment and in a in a kind of a safe contained kind of a way I guess yeah. it's not real you're not going out on the streets looking for real proper horror it's uh you know you can experience it in a safe way that's kind of the the partaking of of the story or the narrative or you know whatever whatever is kind of showing that horror but there's also the taking of christmas tropes and turning those into horror you know santa with the axe or uh, do you think that that it is because christmas represents this uh you know peace on earth goodwill to men uh, everybody you know being putting on their best face and being on the lookout for each other and then seeing that shattered in some way does is that part of the the reason it resonates I think, yeah, definitely. I think you make a good point there. Um, taking something that should be safe and lovely and fuzzy and warm and making that the scary thing uh, is like, th th I think that's why a lot of people can't watch horror films with children in because children are supposed to be innocent and, and we supposed to protect them. But what if they're the ones coming together? I think there's a, a similarity in the, sense there of something that should be nice and safe um being made truly horrific uh, yeah. i'm thinking of films like black christmas uh or um there's a 70s film where there were famous one when joan collins is terrified terrorized by a father christmas outside the window mm. um all the krampus films or yeah the father christmas not bringing you presents but coming to murder you in your bed all those kind of tropes like you said turning it with an axe i think yeah does it i think it, it's hard for them not to be comedic because right. it's there's a slight ridiculousness to it i do yeah. love comedy horror though that's my favorite type of horror which which i think brings it full circle though because at that point you know you're, you're with your family it's a safe space and you're kind of watching this this turn and it brings it full circle because at the same time it's horrific but it's so obtuse in some way that it makes it laughable and so it's there's an inherent absurdism to the very conceit of it yeah yeah there's an absurdism a safety and then it it 
becomes this really interesting self-contained phenomenon that uh, people yeah. can play with. I think uh, like the Tim Burton produced uh, the, the Nightmare Before Christmas. I think that's quite a nice right. example because it takes the Halloween town and then they want to so they kind of want to do Christmas and try to take over Christmas Town, but get it all wrong and basically turn it into a horror show where children are opening presents, but bats fly out and things like that. And I think that's a kind of a cartoon, uh, uh, micro microscopic version of of what we were just talking about. Exactly. Thank you. Um, so we have two minutes left. I want to ask one more question and then see if there's anything that you want to cover that we didn't think to ask. But the the other question I wanted to ask is for really the discipline of folklore. If you were to tell a generation that's really not thought about this as a career that you could go into or a discipline that you could attain, what is the what is the reason that current and future generations should should study folklore? Folklore is everything we do. It's around everybody, whoever you are, whether you have um, some kind of religious belief or whether you have ever been to a wedding or uh, any kind of ritual, like I mentioned earlier, which way round do you put the toilet roll on the toilet roll holder? Do you wear lucky socks to go to exams or anything like that? Folklore is everything we do. It's not just the big spooky dark things it's not just ufos and slender man and witches and vampires i mean there is all that cool stuff as well but i think folklore studies helps us understand how and why people are <laughs> how how we, why we act on beliefs where those beliefs come from um, and that feeds right through into things like conspiracy theories and how people might what people come to believe about whether you get a vaccine or not all that kind of stuff that is all that stuff how those beliefs come about how they're communicated all of that is folklore it's all related how it's communicated in media the movies the films the tv that we watch it's everywhere and i don't i don't see how it isn't relevant basically so and and it's that. such a crossover of disciplines as well it involves um journalism it's it's media it's uh anthropology it's ethnology it's psychology all of those things kind of coalesce I think in folklore and its strength is that it kind of ties many, many different disciplines and studies of other things together. I came to it from a background of film studies. I, I was a film studies scholar and I only started studying folklore for my um, doctorate. So I, I just fell in love with it because it's everything, basically. <laughs> yeah, I love that answer. Thank you. Yeah. I feel like it's one of those things that's very easy to fall into accidentally because you're like, oh, this is really cool. And then you stumble upon it. You're like, oh, this is this covers so much stuff. At least that's been my experience so far, still learning a lot. Every time we speak to somebody, we hear a new term of art or a new area of study that you could go into, like hauntology today is our big takeaway. We're going to go lose ourselves in that for yeah, you know, weeks now, <laughs> yeah. at least. <laughs> yeah. Yes. <laughs> well, if you need any tips, let me know. Any don't want guidance. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> I think something interesting about folklore studies is that um, it's much more respected in, in North America than it is in Britain as a discipline, which is one of the things me and my colleagues at the Centre for Contemporary Legend would like to change. I mean, it's it started in Britain and the Folklore Society started in the late 1800s. Um, and it's actually started in Sheffield, the oh, wow. uh, Sheffield University. There are two universities in Sheffield. I work at Sheffield Hallam, and there's another one called Sheffield University. Uh, and it, it's actually one of the original kind of places where folklore was was studied. Um, but there are very few. You can't really study just folklore studies in England. Mm. Uh, there are there are courses in. Ireland and, and Scotland and Wales that look particularly look at Celtic studies, but yeah, it's much has much uh, more um, impetus as a discipline in North America. So we want to get it going again here. <laughs> it's struggling here too, though, because we were. I mean, Perry and I just before this call were talking about how um, the one of the universities in Kentucky uh, is cutting their program, and they had one of the better programs in in folklore studies. 
Yeah, Western Kentucky University is just, they're removing the funding from that program. And a lot of uh, good folk horse came out of that program. And so it's, uh, it's people see it as a foreshock. Um, you know, as I've been doing the research for this podcast, I started to say, hey, could I potentially go get a master's in folk horror? And I was looking for online programs and there there are none. Um, oh, wow. So when you're wanting to study this and potentially some of the people that could make the biggest impact, people who are mid-career, who have a lot of multidisciplinary understanding, have the time to go into something that's a little bit more risky career-wise as well um, and take that on, you can't find anything unless you're willing to relocate and go physically somewhere at this point. There's an irony, too, because in the digital age we're in, uh, we are making folklore faster than ever right. and folk groups forming all across these boundaries. Yeah, and folklorists so, yeah. can't keep up with the folklore and contemporary legend that's happening, yeah. <laughs> well, and I would love to get you back at some point and just dive into contemporary legend too, because there's a you know whole treasure trove we could get in. We, we could never even have the amount of time. Well, I'd be very happy to do that. We've we've actually got. Um, it's going to be a big deal for us. We've got the International Society for Contemporary Legend Research, uh, which is a global group, is holding their 40th anniversary annual conference at my university where I'm one of the hosts of awesome. it with oh. me and my colleague David Clark who's a leading ufologist uh, and another colleague Andrew Robinson who's a photographer and we're all interested in folklore and yeah we're going to be hosting that major international conference. Oh that's super cool. Folklore's coming home to Sheffield the home where it was first studied. Thanks so much for listening, and thanks to Dr. Diane Rogers for spending time with us. Check out our show notes for more information about Diane and her work, some interesting related books, and links to the International Society for Contemporary Legend, the Center for Contemporary Legend Group, and more. If you have any questions, feedback, ideas for a future episode, or anything else really, you can reach us at hello at eighthlayermedia.com. That's also where to hit us up if you're interested in sponsoring the show. Hello at eighthlayermedia.com. Digital Folklore is created and produced by Eighth Layer Media and is distributed by Realm. Thanks for listening.